I'm going to start over. <laughs> Thank you all for your patience. One of Toni Morrison's books is called Mercy, so I appreciate your, your mercy and grace in this moment. Okay, thank you for coming. Um, I'm excited to talk about Toni Morrison and the role that God plays in some of her novels. Uh, there's a lot about Toni Morrison that we know. We know that she's one of the most celebrated and important writers of our culture and of our time. She's in the pantheon of great novelists, along with um, gosh, John Updike and uh, John Irving, Saul Bellow, um, Ann Tyler, Marilyn Robinson. Um, her novels are required reading across colleges and universities. They have been for years. And in the spring of 2006, she got this really, really incredible honor. The New York Times Book Review named Beloved the best work of American fiction published in the last 25 years. And it wasn't just the New York Times that was doing that. It was a whole like collection of editors and writers, um, critics who all contributed, notable critics who all contributed to, uh, to that list. And that's what they named, um, that's what the award that, that Beloved got, the best work of American fiction published in the previous 25 years. And so when Toni Morrison is talked about, it's often said, how long overdue it was for her novels to win the awards that they did win. And she won all of the major ones, the Pulitzer Prize for Literature, the National Book Award, the National Book Critics Circle Award. And she was the first black woman to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Very, very first ever. Um, no one had, had won, um, no black woman had won before, before Tony. And so what else do we know? We know that Tony always writes from the perspective of African-American communities and black cultures. And throughout her career, she's always been really clear and just unapologetic about that. Um, and she had this really great uh, interview with the Times Union in New York explaining that her writing and her authorial style grew directly out of a black literary tradition. Uh, so what does that mean? So Tony explains, she says, it's an oral tradition. Uh, it's a tradition full of three and four levels of seeing. It's this presence of ancestry. And we see how ancestry functions on a day-to-day -day basis in, her no in my novels. And for me, it's very much, me meaning Tony, this is her still quoting, me quoting her. Um, for me, it's very much homegrown from black culture. In wanting to fill a void, I've had to write myself as black people into American literature. Even in 1987, the past is veiled and there is an absence of the black presence in American history. And so that's a little bit of the, the culture that Tony was writing in and her novels actually changed all of that. It changed what um, uh, that, that absence. And it's really interesting as much as she focuses on African-American cultures and perspective, um, Morrison says that she does not aim her books at a Black audience, nor uh, any particular group or ideal reader for that matter. But she was completely unfiltered in what she was writing, the perspectives that she was writing from. She was unconcerned with the white gaze. She didn't pander to anyone. I mean, and this was, you know, no, no one was really doing this, especially in fiction at this particular time. Um, so her boldness, her unafraidness, her, her courage, I mean, that's what puts her in the pantheon um, of all of these other incredible writers. And that's why we still read her today and we will for generations and generations. Um, her novels are about family, race relations, history, reclaiming our physical bodies, falling in love, losing love, building communities. And even though she wrote about the harsh realities of racism and sexism, she said in an interview with the Washington Post, I don't want political forces history, slavery, racism, any of these concrete things to have the last word, people have imaginations. They relate to the world on a very personal and wonderful level. And it's what makes life human and humane. So I wanted to talk today about Tony's work because of course we talk about what a major writer she is. And in today's culture, we talk about her writing language. Um, so if you've read her work, you know, like what it's rich and it's lush and it's folkloric and it's rugged and it's earthy and it's soaring. And she calls it uh, the purposefulness of language. That's how she describes her writing style. It is poetic. Some of her books have this almost kind of a circular, like non-literal, non-linear um, style and time frame to it. 
Um, her novels have a dreamy, they have this kind of rich, like dreamy quality. And when we talk about the African-American characters and communities that inhabit her novels, we talk about the supernatural, the myth and the folklore. We talk about uh, the womanist and the feminist aspects of her novels. But, and we also talk about the African religious traditions in her novels. But we don't talk a lot about, actually really only until maybe recent years, the last two, three, four, maybe five years, is the role of God and religion in her novels. Um, and also in her background. Because you really can't talk about God in her novels without talking about her own background, which we'll go into in just a moment. So it's interesting that um, not a lot has been written on it until recently, but when you go into it, it's just this treasure, I couldn't believe it, just this treasure trove of how religion and spirituality um, impact all of Tony's novels. And I was fascinated by this topic at first because so many of her novels have religious titles. So I entered this like, first of all, from a very kind of surfacey point of view. Um, her titles are Beloved, There's Paradise, A Mercy, Love, God Help the Child. The novel Song of Solomon has a town in it called Mercy. The novel Paradise is a convent of women who are killed and then their bodies disappear. And in Morrison's novels, there are, oh, there's so much that's related to, to God and to Christianity and to Catholicism in particular, which we'll go into, um, and just overall biblicalness. But there are sermons, there are hymns, there are resurrections, there are prayers, there are ministers, there are damaged bodies that are turned whole. There are sacred spaces. There's Marian imagery of a mother holding or carrying a deceased child. There are ghosts. There are maybe spirits that are caught in a kind of purgatory. There is pleading for mercy and healing, and there is reconciliation. And of course, there is talk about salvation. So that's all in Tony's uh, Tony's fiction. So I wanted to dig a little bit into all of this and explore, um, try to figure out a little bit about why uh, why God is so important in her novels and what she was trying to do with with her spiritual with her religion when it comes to the fiction that she that is a mission, was a mission for her to write. Um, so a little bit about her background information. Uh, so Tony was born in the steel town of Lorraine, Ohio, uh, back in 1931. She passed away in 2019. And she, a lot of people don't know this, she was a book editor before she was a professional writer. And she was the first black female editor in fiction um, at Random House. And she worked there from 1967 to 1983. And it was incredible what she did there. Like she ushered in some of the most talented and culture shifting writers who happened to be African-American or Caribbean or African. And she was the first one who published them. And she published them at Random House. People like Henry Dumas and Angela Davis, the political activist, um, poet June Jordan, Tony Cade Bambara, the gorgeous literary writer. Um, Gail Jones, like Toni Morrison as an editor, literally discovered Gail Jones, who's this mythic and mythical writer. I mean, you almost can't describe Gail. She's so brilliant. Um, Huey Newton, political activist and Black Panther. Toni Morrison published his book. And she also published as an editor, um, Muhammad Ali, uh, Muhammad Ali's autobiography. That's like the definitive, one of the definitive books um, on him. The first one before Quincy Troop did, did his uh, definitive book on Ali. Um, so just a little bit more. Oh, and she was still a senior editor at Random House when her first four novels were published. So, which is really, really fascinating. Um, so I want to say just a bit more about Tony's career as a book editor, then we'll go to God, I promise. Um, so in publishing, so there's a lot of editors who want to be writers, not all of them, but there's a good number. And Tony was one of them. Now her editor is a man named Robert Gottlieb who, I, like when I say this man is a legend, I mean, he's just legend with capital L. A lot of you I'm sure probably know of him, um, but he was editor in chief at Simon & Schuster. And then he was editor in chief at Knopf. And Knopf, you know, of course, is like the literary imprint at Random House. And he edited, he was Tony's longtime editor. So first they were colleagues. Um, he was the one who helped convince her to leave her editor job at Random House so that she could go write full time. Um, and he published, I think almost, I think most of her novels, not all of them, because at a certain point he left Random House to go and run uh, The New Yorker. But during that time, he was her editor. He's still alive. He's 91 years old. And he's edited writers like John Cheever, Doris Lessing, Salman Rushdie, 
John Le Carre, okay. Ryan Berry, Amaya yeah. Guzan, Margaret Drabble, Edna O'Brien, who wrote The Things We Carried, D.S. Nipel, Mordecai Rickler. He even edited Catch-22 by Joseph Heller and Robert Caro. He was Robert Caro's longtime editor and he even published uh, The Power Broker by Robert Caro. So the reason why I'm naming, oh, and Toni Morrison. So of course, so the reason why, so, <laughs> this is not a forum on Robert Gottlieb, though maybe the next one I do should be, because he's just, like he's worked on some of the most seminal books of our modern culture. But the reason why I mention all those names and why he's a big deal is to show the talent that he recognized in Toni. Um, and of course that talent is all hers. Like the talent, the talent is all hers, the skill is all hers. Um, but they had a great, uh, a great relationship. And I mentioned those writers because they all made significant contributions to the books that we read and that we love now, generation after generation. And so of course, Tony is a huge, huge part of, um, of that canon. So it's a little bit of background information on Tony, her career before she started being a writer. So um, now in shifting to the role that God plays in Tony's fiction, um, so I wanna start with her name. So Tony's name, her writing name, came out of her own religious experience of converting to Catholicism. I didn't even know she was Catholic until, and she's apparently a very, very uh, Catholic writer, but she was raised in an African, um, in the AME church. So the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And her mother was a devout member. Several of her family members though were Catholic. So that's how she was exposed to Catholicism and that led to her baptism. Um, she converted to Catholicism at the age of 12 and she took on the name St. Anthony, who is the patron. So I thought we get Tony, she had no idea, St. Anthony, but it's really fascinating. She, so he, um, St. Anthony is the patron saint of lost things. And when you think of her work, that is so fitting because loss and lost, like these through lines, like run all through her novels, lost souls, lost love, lost bodies, losing history, but trying not to lose your history. And then how all of those things are found again and reclaimed. So all of those threads run through Toni Morrison's entire body of work. Uh, but I thought that I thought that was fascinating. But I knew her for her or the name she was given that she was born with is Chloe, Chloe Wolford. Um, and then she got married. That's where Morrison comes from. But Tony is from is from St. Anthony uh, when she was uh, baptized as a Catholic. Um, let's see. Uh, so yeah, I was fascinated by this, not knowing she was Catholic. Um, and Morrison Tony even says herself that she became Catholic because of its sense of story and visuals. And so I quote, she says, that's shallow, she once joked, but that's what it was until I grew up a little older and began to take it seriously, Catholicism, and then took it more seriously for years and years and years. So religion was important to her both individually and collectively. Um, growing up and as an adult, she routinely went to mass. Um, and then uh, Tony becomes kind of what she is, I guess we describe now as um, kind of a lapsed Catholic. She calls it a, a disaffected Catholic. Um, and that was because of Vatican II. Um, she, and for her, her religious identity became a little enigmatic. That's the word that she used. She didn't like that Latin was no longer a part of, of Catholicism. Um, and so she kind of got away from it a little bit, but it still, um, but it still became a huge, huge part of her fiction. Um, and in the book uh, about, there's a book called Longing for an Absent God, which emerges, and this book says that Catholicism, the ritual and the community of Catholicism are what we see really heavily in Tony's, um, in Tony Morrison's fiction. Her Catholicism illuminates her fiction, in particular, her view of bodies and the narrative power of stories. So her Catholicism illuminates her fiction, again, in particular, her view of bodies and the narrative power of stories. So I'll break that down in just a, just a minute. Um, her commitment to history and tradition actually feels Catholic in, in orientation. Um, she, sought to merge, she sought to merge the vernacular with the lyric 
with the standards and with the biblical because it was part of the ling linguistic heritage of my family, moving up and down the scale, across it, in it, and between it. Um, in her family, she talks about the, the language. It was highly sermonic. It was highly formalized. It was biblical in a sense. And so all of that um, came into her fiction as well. She said in her family, the way they talked, they could easily move into the language of the King James Bible and then back to standard English and then segue into language that you know, we would call street language or vernacular. So that was the, um, the dynamic of, of Toni Morrison and her family that also became the dynamic in many of her, in much of her fiction. Um, from her first novel, Toni Morrison was very intent on forcing us to look at um, at pain, in particular Black pain with the full power of language. And as a Catholic writer, she wanted us to see the body on the cross. Um, she was very comfortable with the grotesque. She was very comfortable with the blood and the cuts and sweat. Um, and we see that in her novel, Beloved. And so that was a novel where she, that really kind of catapulted her. She was, had huge success before that, but Beloved was what really, really catapulted her. Um, into much more visibility. And that's the book that won, uh, let's see, the Pulitzer and the National Book Award. And Beloved is a novel inspired by the true story of an enslaved African-American woman who escaped slavery, but was pursued by hunters and facing a return to slavery. The woman, this is actually based on a true story, ends the life of her two-year-old daughter. But she was captured before she, she kills her daughter, and then she was captured before she could harm herself. And Morrison's novel imagines the deceased baby returning as a ghost, and as the ghost and the spirit to actually haunt her mother and family, but she ends up redeeming her and actually ends up um, in this very life-affirming position. So it's a really, really just lush and incredible novel. Um, and the way that we see religion and God in particular in Beloved is um, again in that, that just that rich language. For example, there's a fully dressed woman who walks out of the water. There's a ghost made of flesh. Beloved emerges from a stream. Beloved is the, um, the, the, the deceased baby spirit. Um, Beloved emerges from a stream and leans against a mulberry tree. We just heard about the mulberry tree in, in a sermon a couple weeks ago. Beloved sits there all day and night. Her whole body is in pain, especially her lungs. Soaked, her breath squeezes like asthma, yet she still smiles. Her skin is lineless and smooth. A day later, she walks through the woods and sits on a stump near the steps. She passes in and out of sleep, her neck bending. Her arrival is audacious and miraculous. So what Tony does is there's this, this focus on um, this focus on the body, the body suffering, the body carrying pain. There are a couple, there's a Christ-like figure within Beloved. And Toni Morrison calls this the magic and the mystery and the things of the body. And uh, it, it's really interesting the way religion also plays a role in Toni's life. Um, spirituality was already a way of life for many Africans sold into slavery. But when combined with the new religion of the people who chose to enslave them in the United States, religion then became this very complicated necessity for survival. Um, religion was what you needed to do in order to live. And it's really, uh, pretty fascinating too how Tony explores that. Again, it's almost like a, like a three-legged stool. Um, there's the African, uh, the African traditions from the enslaved people, the people who were enslaved brought to the US. Then number two, there, were, there was the religion for the people choosing to enslave them. And then number three, there was what the communities did, which was kind of meld that together with myth and folklore and then create, kind of create their own, um, their own religious tradition. And so that's that kind of three-legged component. That's what we see in so many of, um, of Tony's novels. Uh, so back to Beloved, oh, back up. there's also like this magical realism component to Tony's books. Again, that kind of goes back to a lot of the African myth and folklore. And there's always, always a sense of community. And of course, we learn about that with all of Jesus's teachings. Beloved in particular um, has, uh, actually, let me back up. There's a couple other things that happen in Tony's novels. There are these beautiful sermons, really, really incredible sermons. So I'm going to talk briefly about one in Beloved. 
So in Beloved, there's a character. The character's name is Baby Suggs Holy. And she's like an unchurched preacher. And every single Saturday, Baby Suggs Holy will go out to this clearing and she's followed by men and women and children and she's leading them to this clearing. And this is a ritual, like I said, that happened every Saturday afternoon. And Baby Suggs gathers them and they're in the woods. They follow her to this sacred space. She's in the middle of this clearing. Um, she's enslaved. She's in the middle of this clearing. And then the people following her are kind of in the woods along the sidelines. And Baby Suggs prays. Then she starts to shout. And she shouts, let the children come. This is a theme in Beloved. Let the children come. And the children run toward her in the clearing. Let the mothers hear you laugh. And then the mothers laugh. Let the grown men come. And then the men come. And she's telling them, you know, let your wives and your children see you dance. And she says to the women to let, she actually almost gives them permission to cry. Like with all that they have gone through with their existence at that particular time. She says, cry. So you have crying women and laughing children and dancing men. And she tells the women to cry for the living and to cry for the dead. And they do, and then they mix it all up. So it's now the kids crying and then the men crying and everyone dancing. And then there is nothing but quiet. And then she starts to preach and she does not admonish anyone. She speaks about loving yourself and about loving your heart. And she preaches about imagining the grace that you want to have for yourself and for your people at this particular time of enslavement. And the woods are ringing and the trees are shuddering. And in the scene, we just see so much of what we read in, in the Bible, use of the body, the flesh, the community. I mean, she is gathering the community here and she's doing it within God's creation. This is almost like, like the birth, it's like the birth of, of the birth of the church. It's like the birth of an, of a, uh, um, an early church, no formal education, but you could call unchurched, but faithful and glorious and in community and in relationship with one another. And she almost gave, not almost, I think did in this scene, gave people their freedom. And it is a transcendent, like absolutely transcendent theme. And it's one of the things that makes the book Beloved, um, that makes Beloved, Beloved. No, it's one of the books or one of the scenes that makes this such an important book. Um, and it's easy to see why critic, critics have said that Beloved functions as a kind of, that there are Christ-like figures in the novel. There's a, a character, Seth, Sethi, Seth, who is almost the spirit of the incarnation. She's a spirit become flesh. And she leads to the healing of the mother who um, killed her child to the mother or to the redemption and the healing of so many people in the community. And in the theology of incarnation, it is human flesh as well as spirit that has value that should be loved and cherished. And that's one of the main things that Tony um, puts forth so richly and strongly in Beloved. Toward the end of Beloved, she says, you are your own best self. And it's interesting what Tony says herself, Tony Morrison says herself about Beloved. She says, it is the search for the Beloved, the part of the self that is you and loves you and is always there for you. And that sounds, of course, like she's talking about love. So we talk about loving God as we love ourselves, loving each other as we love ourselves. But it also, to me, sounds a little bit like she's talking about the soul. And soul, of course, is through, I mean, beloved and paradise. Um, for example, in the, all through those novels, but in the novel Paradise, this is a novel about, uh, and it's really interesting. It's a novel about a group of women Tony actually does not identify them racially. She intentionally does not do that. But they all live in an abandoned Catholic convent on the edge of an all black town called Ruby. It's in Oklahoma in uh, the 20th century. And the women are um, it's kind of this unintentional boarding house for women who are kind of quote unquote uh, tainted. And all of the women have these really incredible, or have these, um, these religious names like divine, uh, grace, consolata, meaning comfort. Um, and these women are murdered by, so of course death clearly is playing a big role in Tony's novels, but people are resurrected and they come back. 
But anyway, these women are um, murdered by men and their bodies disappear before their burial. So of course, very, very similar to, to um, Jesus in the tomb. And in Sojourner's magazine, it says a witness and citizen of the town believes that that disappearance of the body is a, or bodies is a sign that God has taken his servants to heaven. So much like the return that Eden, uh, the return to Eden that's laid out in the Bible. Um, the biblical Eden was supposed to be a place of freedom, but its inhabitants failed to obey the restriction placed on eating the forbidden fruit. And Morrison depicts the town of Ruby as a kind of Eden for African-Americans during this particular time. It was a place um, that had been founded after racial violence, but then the people kind of turned that on its head and used this place as home as a way to escape, um, to escape the burdens of racism. Um, and then of course the convent. So in this book, In Paradise, the convent plays a huge, huge role. Um, so that's another really fascinating uh, way the way religion plays out in Tony's novels. Um, in Song of Solomon, there are female characters named Pilate and Hagar. And at a funeral, so there's this really, again, another really incredible scene in Song of Solomon where there's a minister, um, preacher Richard Misner, Misner, Meisner, who is really frustrated that the town has become so insular. And he thinks that it's become so insular to the detriment of uh, the outside world. Like they're no, longer, they're no longer paying attention to social movements and things that are happening in the outside world. So he's giving a sermon and he is so um, perplexed at what's going on and saddened and angered and frustrating that he is speechless. And in the scene, he's speechless for minutes and all he is doing is holding a cross in front of him, like outstretched, and that, and that is the sermon. And that goes on for minutes. And you see in the book, the, the congregation, each person take, like staring at him and just taking like different things from his silence. But Toni Morrison calls it a sermon. She actually doesn't call it silence, but she calls it a sermon. And just the visual of that, him being silent and then just holding, like holding the cross outstretched, almost shaking. So that the people somehow become aware to not, you know, be focused on how insular they are, but also on, or the way he thinks they are, but to focus on the outside world. And it's just a haunting, really incredible scene. Um, at the end of that book, there, or the end of that scene, there is an actual sermon with a voice. The character Hagar um, actually uses her voice, and it's a very kind of empowering, um, very empowering scene as well. Um, and last, so in the book, uh, Spiritual Vision, this is actually, it's called, I have it here, it's called Toni Morrison's Spiritual Vision, Faith, Folktales, and Feminism in Her Life and Literature. It was published a few years ago. The author says that in Morrison's literature, people fly, they resurrect the dead, they foretell the future, there's prophecy, ghosts return to their loved ones, and there are these amazing occurrences that take place in her fiction that don't particularly surprise her characters because in the African worldview, miracles are possible just as they are in the Catholic cosmology. And Toni Morrison says herself, the divine and the human, that is what art is for. That's when art is doing its job, when it can put those two things together, the divine and the human. You don't see the cracks. You don't see the separation. And that is what she believes art is for. And that is what she tried, I think, quite successfully to do with her art. Thank you. So I know that was a lot of info. So thank you for bearing with the elliptical nature of it. I'm happy to answer any, try to answer any questions. Yeah, uh, Carrie. This is a high-level self Can you draw a line between Tony Morrison and Elvis Cleaver? You know, Soul on Night. Some of the early, uh, some of the early with Man, Cow, and Fox. They were more like uh, memoirs, I think. The early Neil Black writing, but. Um, it's just so interesting to me to think that she came out of almost out of nowhere and you know, a different level of literary statement. 
So you're absolutely right. Let's go ahead and write an answer. I just want to, and I have a note. I have a note. I just want to make sure I get the author's names right so that I can, we can try to draw that line. That's right. Okay. Yes. Um, so at that time, so this now is, let's see. So Tony was writing, let's see. The Blue Sky was published in 1970. So that was her first, um, that was her first novel. Excuse me. And so right up until, let's see, maybe, um, she go as far back as Chester Himes. So Chester Himes was writing in like the 1940s and the 1950s. So he's an African-American man, African-American male writer. And he, so his novels were, um, his novels were, they were so good, but they were, uh, they're mysteries. They're mysteries. They were, um, they were gritty. They, uh, you know, just like kind of harsh, beautiful language. Um, so he wrote, uh, so they were mysteries. He wrote, I guess now we would call him like a crime, um, crime writer. And uh, so he was published around the 40s and the 50s. And then from there, so that was something where you're having just this very raw, um, kind of raw experience uh, of African-American communities, but it was very kind of, out, it was outside of the general African-American community. And it was outside, a little bit outside of the white gaze as well. It was kind of very separate. He was so re absolutely respected, but still just a little separate. Um, at the same time, you had James Baldwin, who was writing, let's see, a little bit in the U.S., but then he moved to Europe. This is still about now the 1940s, and the, we're getting toward the 50s and the 60s. And what happened closer to the 50s and the 60s was um, you have what was called the Black Writers Alliance. And so this was an alliance that was set up in um, Harlem. It was in New York. And it had writers like, uh, actually like James Baldwin, John Oliver Killens, um, John Henry Clark, Rosa Guy, Paul Marshall, um, even Maya Angelou, I think Audre Lorde was kind of part of the, that crew, Lorraine Hansberry, Louise Merriweather. So all these writers were writing these seminal books. A lot of their books um, had the, the sole vision of social change and like addressing so social unrest, addressing social change. So this is now in the 50s and the 60s. So then moving to the 70s, early 70s, you had then what's called the Black Arts Movement. And so that was kind of dominated a lot by, uh, by playwrights, by poets like Nikki Giovanni, Rosa Guy. Um, there was a lot of spoken word. Uh, I think this is actually where um, uh, I, I would argue that the birth of hip hop that came out of the black arts movement. Um, it was also a response to, of course, the assassination of Martin Luther King, um, Malcolm X, the Black Panthers. So all of this writing was coming out of all of those movements. So yes, Gary, it's a long-winded way of answering your, your question. You had the Black Writers Alliance, in New York in the 50s and the 60s. In the 70s, you had um, the, um, the, sorry, what was the movement? Yeah, the Black Arts Movement. Like I said, a lot of it focused on playwrights and poets. Um, and then Tony, it's really interesting where Tony kind of comes into that world. So Tony, I would say, is actually in it and of it and a little bit outside it. And so the reason why I say a little bit outside it is because her work, she, she never, let's see, first, a lot of those other writers, I will call multi, kind of multi-hyphenates. So like I said, they're novelists, they're poets, they might be memoirists, like um, Maya Angelou wrote, like maybe seven different memoirs. So they played with structure and form. Tony was very, Tony Morrison was very, at that time, very, very focused on her novels. She did write a couple plays later on. She wrote a little bit of nonfiction later on, but her main focus were, what today you know we would call these literary novels so it was not necessarily to change the world she would say this not necessarily to um get people to see a certain way of life but she just wanted to depict african-american communities and depict love and african-american culture and to do it in this very unfiltered way where again she totally just focused on the language again back to her own phrase the purposefulness of language um, so it's a little bit of a, maybe it's a little bit of a wavy, a little bit of a, um, of a wavy line. I would say she's also one of the writers who does incorporate, again, that, that three-legged stool, um, the myth and the folklore from, um, from Africans who were enslaved, uh, the Christian tradition, and, um, and then also the, the, the melding and the innovative the innovative almost radicalness that came out of both of those that we use to create our own. 
So that's a bit of a wavy line from those movements to, to, Tony, to Tony Morrison. And again, she, I don't want to use the word crossover because so many people were already reading her book, um, but just the, the literary acclaim, the awards that she got. Again, she was highly, actually, un, she's grateful, but highly unconcerned with all of that as well. Does that answer fully your question? Okay, probably too long. Okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah, can you, yeah. yeah um, she was also a very successful academician at the university. She was one of the first, if not the first woman to get tenure at Princeton University. She was one of the first, if not the first African American woman to get tenure at Princeton University. Oh, that's right. That's right. Did that? Yes. Yeah, so, so, yeah. She. Um. She, yeah. It's really huge. And she was was it went to Howard for undergrad, then I think went to Cornell for graduate school, and then taught right for years and years and years at Princeton. Uh, and then I think even after she retired from Princeton, teaching there, I want to say, what was that, maybe 2008, 2007, 2008, she would go back and do writer's workshops. Of course, she got honorary degrees all over the place. And um, but that is true. I think she was the first, first ever uh, African-American person to be tenured at Princeton. Uh, yes, Teresa. Do you think that was crucial to her success? Do you think she had found her way out? Like, is it common to see editors to figure out about motherhood? Yeah, I love that question. You know, she, let's see. So I would, you know, it's very interesting. I would say she lived in, she would probably not say this, but I might. Um, there were a few different worlds that, two, maybe two different worlds that she lived in. So one, so yeah, she was always, uh, always a teacher, always an academic. Um, let's see. So she, she was a single mother. Uh, so of course, raising, raising kids. So definitely had, the, did not, I mean, she had to work. So that's one thing. It's not so much affluence where she could kind of choose. I mean, of course she could choose, but it wasn't, um, um, she was relying on her own paycheck. Her kids were of course relying on her paycheck. So she called herself, um, so when I was, she would say this, when I was a teacher, um, I was a teacher who wrote. I was an editor who wrote. Um, I was a tenured professor who wrote. So she always, always viewed herself as a writer. So I think that was definitely her, her heart. Um, she, let's see, she started her publishing career at an academic publish, an academic publisher. Um, and this was, I think, 1968. So a couple of years before she started at Random House. So she had her, because of her academic background, going to Howard and graduate school and um, teaching even before she got into publishing. So that definitely was her foot in the door, her academic background. Um, and then she taught. So then after she, after she spent two years at that academic publisher, then she went to Random House. And that, so that is probably where, um, I call it privileged is the right way. It, it's definitely a very specific, a very specific world, but she was clearly such a talented, such a talented editor, knew how to pick writers um, that are now part of the canon, that are, that have you know, made the canon explode in good ways. So she was able to identify that and have those writers published. Um, and then probably just happenstance, I mean, to actually be at the same for her and Robert Gottlieb, her editor to be working at the same, you know, at the same company is pretty, pretty incredible. But oh, actually, you know, this is important. He got wind of her because she had already published The Bluest Eye. And so that was her first novel. That was, I think, the one novel that Random House and uh, Robert Gottlieb did not publish, but it was the, that novel and her talent and skill with The Bluest Eye put her on the map. And that's an incredible, oh, it's one of my favorite novels. That's a novel of um, a young woman named Pecola, young girl named Pecola Breedloves, African-American, grew up in a, um, in a town very similar to the one Tony grew up in and she wants to have blue eyes. And it is just, oh my God, it, it is just raw and searing and beautiful. And you wanna jump into these pages to, to embrace this young girl. And you see herself, her mother's, not her self-actualization, but you see Piccola's mother's self-actualization um, in the bluest eye. So, um, so yeah, she, she that's very interesting. That's a great question. I think Tony's, um, she, like I said, definitely had, uh, had had to work. Um, and then at a certain point, you know, she definitely did not have to when her kids were older and the awards and all the incredible success she had. Um, but just an incredibly talented and skilled, just supernaturally skilled um, editor and writer. And that kind of got her into these worlds and helped her I don't know, usher herself through through those through those worlds. But yeah, I'm sure probably luck and happenstance. And you're right, publishing is a very, it's a rare, specific and very rarefied. And a rarefied world. So all that, all that 
together made her who she is. Yes, that's good. Uh, I, think, you know, I, I wanted to follow up on the question about her uh, academic career at Princeton, which, as we all know, is a very elite, pretty overwhelmingly white university. And I have found myself over the years of reading her books curious about what her classes would be like and what her curriculum was. I mean, what did she have her students read? And did she focus on the writing? Did she focus on her own voice and her own vision. And I, do you have any insights in what taking a class from her at Princeton would have been like? Um, I know. <laughs> don't <be wrong. laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, I think, okay. So she, you know, she had to be a little bit I have a couple friends who either, maybe one, who went to Princeton at the time she did or either who knows someone who either have a, as a sibling or who knows someone who did. So I will get, I will get back to you on that. Um, but I did, when I was at, let's see, when I was working, when I, was, I was at Harper, I was an assistant, um, assistant editor at Harper Collins at the time. And the, my boss, amazing manager, um, Megan, who I was reporting to went to Princeton. Now she didn't, she was there after Toni Morrison was there, but I remember her occasionally saying anecdotes that her classes of course were absolutely I mean, just jam-packed. They were absolutely filled, um, like standing room only. They would always have a tough time trying to figure out how big to make them, how small to make them. Um, I heard that she would, uh, she was very no holds barred and gentle and took people to task in probably one of the most graceful and gracious ways you had to work in her class. Um, it was an honor to be in her class. So I do remember Megan saying those, those particular things from her friends um, who took classes when she was at Princeton, uh, when, who took her friends who took classes with Toni Morrison when she was at Princeton. But I will, I will get more details on that. I love that question. That's a great one about, yeah, what her, and I wonder if she taught her own work. So anyway, I'll, you know, what the syllabus looks like, that's a great, so I'll, I'll find out. I won't find out. Um, she, she was there, she was at Random House from, I think, 68 until 83, and then Princeton, I believe, was from the late 80s, is that right, early 90s, and then she graduated around 2000, I'm sorry, graduated, um, left Princeton around 2007, 2008, but I'll, but I'll, Barbie, I'll email Barbie those specific dates, but I know that's the ballpark, but I'll email those specific dates to you, make sure they're accurate. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Yes, Susan. Wondering, so taken together, you know, what in her novels, what is it, what is what does God look like? What is the image of God that actually comes across? How would she summarize that? What does she have to say about God? Yeah, I think in the one word that kept on coming up in doing some of this research was um, was malleable. Which is really interesting. So malleable meaning, I don't think she necessarily saw, actually, no, yes, I think for her, God was malleable and dynamic. And I use those two words in particular, again, because um, in her novels, one of the, the again, those through lines, uh, the through line that comes out are those three, those three traditions, yeah, that we keep on going back to. So from um, Africa, uh, when um, Africans were coming over who were enslaved in the U.S., again, the, um, the people who chose to enslave them, the, uh, that religion, the Christian religion, and then the, um, the amalgamation that came, and the, resistance, and the departure that came out of those two. So I think if there's one commonality, it is the dynamism of that. It's the, um, the openness and the malleability of, of that. Um, there's always this in, in, with God, you see that in her novels, you see that there's um, almost like this fantastical, uh, miraculous, you know, again, the mulberry tree and the woman coming out of the water. There's this, this um, uh, mysticalness to it. There's, God is not ethereal in her books. It's very interesting. Not like feel good, ethereal God. Like that is definitely not, um, not a through line. But, um, and then you often have, so mixed with that fantastical, and the myth, and then you also have God is just highly, highly, highly ordinary. And people like again that scene with um, Baby Suggs Holy, and the dancing, and the preaching, and the saving one another, and the giving permission. So that, um, and that's like this 
just this all encompassing redemptive God, a God that doesn't have to look like anyone else's God, um, except the one that comes out of what the particular person and what that particular community needs. Um, I think God clearly responds to pain. There's a, a, a pain of, um, I don't want to say a God of pain, but there's um, a God that aligns with pain and suffering in her, in her novels and that truly is telling you and telling them that they are still, that, that truly, I mean, still like love, like still, I love you and love yourself. Like that's, that's, so it is this moving dynamic, um, my goodness, just malleable, fixed in the earth and <laughs> fixed in Africa and all that. Um, God. So I know that's, that's, that's a lot, but that's, that's God in Toni Morrison novels, in my, my opinion. Um, I want to talk a sense of freedom as well and 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 her. And I know, I mean, that comes with the with the notion of slavery, but it also with the Christian freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of flight and of um, the wholeness. Yeah, that's just probably a really good word to answer Susan's question. Yes, the God of um, wholeness. And yes, like that, again, back to that scene in um, Beloved where uh, where Baby Suggs Holy is giving giving permission, you know, giving permission for the, the Africans and African-Americans who are enslaved to laugh and dance and cry. I mean, where that, that it, like she, and she's African-Americans, no one else giving them permission, but even that, um, even that is, is, is freedom. You're right. Like that's the sense of freedom, um, Christian freedom that runs through that book that runs through all of her books. Um, Julie, I love how you mentioned flight. I think it's the end of, is it the song of Solomon where, yeah, that's where it, it ends with, um, is that right? With like two characters kind of in flight or in, in midair kind of encountering one another. I think one of them has a gun, um, anyway, but that's toward the ending. So there's flight, but yes, that's, Gosh, I'll have to look into that too. That's like a whole big, big topic, the role of um of freedom in her in her novels, which is probably just the absolute ultimate goal, probably she might say too, of her of of her novels. It's just that quest for self-actualization um, and freedom. And again, even her back to her quote about how she won't let any social forces have the last say in her novels. Um, like that's not gonna have the last word. It's it is the the freedom and the self-actualization of that particular person. And in most of our novels, women, Black women. Oh, yes, okay. Oh, yeah, last words, fine, okay, yeah. Sure, is there time for one more or should we not? Okay, okay, so we'll do one more, Teresa. Yeah. In chronological order with, I think, um, so the bluest eye, I highly say these definitely start with the bluest eye. And then there is what's called the beloved trilogy, um, which, which actually, I, a lot of people don't know that it actually is a trilogy. So it's um, beloved. And then jazz is number two. And then I think song of, I think song of Solomon is number three. So I was, so I would, I would start with the bluest eye. It is, this is going to this coming of age novel and it just rips your heart out, puts it back together again. It's incredible. So the bluest eye, the 1970, her first novel. Thank All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you so much.